Hello, this is Nicholas Tanak from yourkinkyfriends.com. I have a legend with me, um, a very extremely wonderful uh, woman who is um, an activist in the kink community and you're just in the community itself. She is helping people. She is, she, I, I would call her a hero in the kink community. Her name is Susan Wright. She is from ncffreedom.org, which is the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom. Yes. Okay. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> all right. So, all right. Let's just get into it. Tell us about, um, you know, ncffreedom.org and, and the organization, the website, um, and everything. Great. Well, Coalition for Sexual Freedom is um, an advocacy group for um, the kink and non monogamy communities, primarily. So, we, we help people who are being discriminated against or um, groups or businesses that are having to try to deal with professionals. We deal with the media. We've been doing this for 21 years. So um, we help uh, you know, almost 200 people, groups and businesses a year with our direct services. And we also have different projects and programs that I'm sure we'll talk about to, to directly help people and try to change the way society views us so that we don't have the same problems that we're having right now. Great. Okay. Now, um, you are the founder. You're the person who founded it. Yes, or? I am. It was oh. interesting. I was working on a project for the National Organization for Women, and um, I was trying to get them to take away their anti BDSM policy. They said it was violence against women. So um, I traveled around the country for three years, and while I was doing that, um, I kept hearing from women who said that they lost their job or they'd lost child custody. And um, so I was traveling around and I, I was talking to all the different BDSM groups. And at that time we were not as networked together as we are now. And so I said, you know what, we should all kind of come together and form a coalition so that we can do the advocacy as, as an umbrella group. So that, you know, you, you wouldn't have to go out and deal with the media if you were being attacked, NCSF could do it. And you wouldn't have to go out and lobby for this certain law because NCSF can organize that. So that the educational groups could stay more um, quiet and off the radar and let NCSF kind of be the big public uh, voice. And that's worked really well. Um, things have changed quite a bit in the past 21 years. Okay, was there a specific incident that inspired you to start this foundation? Well, you know, one of the big things that happened was the Houghtons. They were a non-monogamous a non um, uh, group that um, were in upstate New York and they lost their kids. And it kind of activated the, the regional community and I saw a friend of mine really working quite a bit on it, Len Dworkin, to try to you know help them find an attorney that could understand what they were doing and, and was willing to help them. And they were doing some fundraising. And I thought, you know, that's a really interesting idea that kinky people have to help, help other kinky people. And so that's sort of what it was born out of. And then I, as I went around the country, I kept hearing other people saying this, that they were having the same problems. It wasn't just one family, you know, because that was all I had been exposed to. And then suddenly I was being exposed to a, a series of them. And I realized, yeah, this is this is a bigger problem than I had thought. So the Hounds, I'm just curious. Um, I'm not really familiar with the case at all. Um, where where are they located? Where were they from in America? This was in the early 90s. I don't even remember specifically their town. I remember it was upstate New York. Okay. And I just remember they were like a polyamory triad. I believe, and uh, you know, nothing any of us would blink at today, right? Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, what the problem is, is that there's some courts, family courts, if you get in a rural or a very conservative area, where the judge will take the best interest of the child in mind. And for them, that might include moral issues. And so if they're a very religious person or uh, they just never have heard of anything like this, they could judge that you can't have your other lover there if your child is there. So it, what it does is it breaks up poly families where you know part of the family has to actually move away. Or if a mother is there, a single mother is there with her kids, she can't have her lover come over because they're worried about strangers with the kids. Um, I think that we need more research to show that you know this is a completely different situation. Um, and then people maybe wouldn't be uh, forced to give up uh, their families. Now, um Okay, 
what can people do? I'm, I'm a, you know, like a, a lot of my friends are being affected by FOSTA and SESTA and stuff like that. And we'll get into FOSTA and SESTA. But um, what can people do, in, in, you know, kinky people or non-kinky people, just people who want to be, or who want to help? What can people do to help, basically, your cause? Well, it's important that people join these educational groups and they support these educational groups that support NCSF. Um, we get all of our funding from the educational groups, uh, mostly the kink groups, um, although we do have swing and lifestyle groups as well as polyamory groups. And so we're an all volunteer coalition. So if you have certain skills, you can volunteer to help us out. Um, we have people who you know, sit at tables at the local event to make sure that brochures are given out so people understand that if they're looking for an attorney, they can go look at our CAP, our Kink Aware Professionals database. Um, so we have uh, some people work on our social media. So we have all sorts of things that are happening that volunteers are doing uh, for NCSF. So okay. that's the two big things is helping helping raise money because it's expensive to go to these professional conferences. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that budget every year is spent on that because you know the exhibit fees are really expensive, um, and then they want you to buy all this stuff for your booth, which we don't do. We have a bare bones sort of thing um, to kind of bring it down as as much as possible, and just so we can get the information out. But um, but yeah, without our donors, we wouldn't be able to do that. Okay, so for a group like this, which is a very, you know, which is a well-known group, which is a very well-respected group, um, and it's been around for how long? 21 years. 21 years, okay. So if someone was going to start, like, how did it, tell us about the start of it, like, you know, get it, like, networking, getting it together, and, you know, and everything like that. How did you well, do that? Well, I reached out to, like, um, Black Rose. Um, uh, the Euler Spiegel Society, Gay Male SM Activists, NLA International, and Society of Janus in San Francisco. And um, I, I started with those five groups because I figured if I could get those five groups to agree, then we would have the beginnings of our coalition. So um, they all agreed, and um, they they you know joined as coalition partners, and they put a rep um, so that you know somebody we can communicate with. They voted in a board. Um, because the coalition partners control NCSF. And from there, we've grown from five to 75 uh, now, coalition partners. And that's on our website. Um, and it's, you know, educational groups, it's um, events, um, it, which are sometimes businesses, it's clubs, like brick and mortar clubs, like for the lifestyle. Uh, we have some travel agents, we have some attorneys and some therapy practices. It's as long as it represents more people than just you. Um, you can be a coalition partner. Oh, wonderful, cool. And um, everybody, go to NCSF Freedom or NC, ncsfreedom.org and support support this cause and support this website and this coalition. Okay, now let's let's change it up a bit. Um, do you do you have any specific kinks or fetishes? Um, yes. I'm definitely, um, I'm definitely kinky, and I'm non non monogamous both. So I kind of have my foot in both worlds. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm what they call they used to call like a bedroom submissive, mm -hmm. where in my relationship to my husband for 24 years, we were equal partners, and we make the decisions together. But when it comes to our sexual interactions, it gets kinky. I'm the same way. Yeah, and I'm I'm not into the um, ongoing relationship power dynamic. You know what I mean? It's part of our affection. It's part of our, you know, sex and our flirtation. But in our day-to-day -day dynamic, we're very much very firm partners. Now, also with that, we are non-monogamous, and we have been from the beginning. Um, and um, we've done it with, like, other play partners. We've had people that we've gone out together and had sex in certain environments. We've done it where, um, you know, we've had people that we see um and uh have develop a relationship although we don't tend to do the full out uh, polyamory where it's non-hierarchical um we we tend to because we're so busy in, in a lot of ways <laughs> we really give our emotional energy to each other and have formed this really really strong pair bond and uh we're sort of adventurers together out there checking out the world 
Now, polyamory is not for everybody, obviously. Some people are very much against it. Obviously, kids have been taken away from couples because of it. Um, but um, so what advice would you give or, or how do you make it work? Like, what are some what are some advice on how to make a polyamorous relationship work? You know, it's interesting because I picked I, I was polyamorous, non-monogamous before I met Kelly, uh, my husband. And so um, I, and I'm that way because of um, I think it's a really important philosophy to not try to close off parts of your life. And I think that I always wanted to be open to have relationships with other people. So I was able to convey that to Cal. And I think that's the first thing is you have to communicate what it is that you want and why you want it so that the other person can understand what it is that you're interested in and they can decide if they can agree to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think the communication is huge and I really like it because it forces us to continue to communicate with each other instead of trying to force each other into this idea that we have of a relationship. You know, I might have an idea of what my husband should be like. Well, when you're in an open relationship, it's very much more, what is this relationship like? And how can we make it better? You know, what are our problems that we're, and you know, 24 years, you you have different relationships during that time. You, oh, you know, develop differently because we've grown together and changed together and, um, you know, gone through different phases of our life. So. The big thing for that is um, we decided early on we would always continue to opt in with each other. And um, and I think it's as simple as that. Neither one of us has opted out. Great. Now, um, from my experience, um, there have been kind of two kinds of polyamic, polyamory or non-monogamous relationships, whereas there's anybody can really do whatever they want as long as they kind of like come back to each other. And then there's every like the people that they're polyamorous with uh the the others the other end of the, the spectrum is the people who are poly, they are polyamorous with they kind of either do it together or they they get permission from each other or each other has to at least approve of the other person you know what kind of side would you, are you on you know i'm kind of <laughs> and i think that they you know, everybody's relationship is so uniquely different. Um, so for us, we have no veto power over which e each other does. Um, so, um, uh, and I think that's important because if somebody really wants to do something, they're going to do it. So we've had, you know, terrible fights sometimes about arguments about, you know, what it is that we're doing in our poly world. And uh, maybe when our, our desires were not completely aligned. But we always end up kind of arguing our way to find that common ground that we do have. And um, and I think that's important to try to whatever you want to do, you want to try to find the common ground because you want to keep your relationship healthy. So um, but we also do check in with each other. We do make sure that the other person is is OK with what's happening, um, because I think we're a little bit more probably on the lifestyle side of things where we go out as a couple often and, and we'll do things together, even though sometimes we split off apart from each other i mean we really are kind of a combination of all of it and i think partly that's because when we started doing this polyamory had just been kind of coined as a term and so we didn't have labels to put on it and ideas of oh we have to fit this kind of mold so we really were able to develop it for ourselves now when uh, i'm first of all very curious on how you, i'm always Curious on how kinky people meet, and we'll get to that. But um, we're, we're still talking about polyamory. Um, was it something that you brought up into the relationship, or did he? How did? Oh, no, I definitely. He um, short. You know, when we started dating, finally, which I'll tell you the story of how we met, because that is kind of a cute story. Um, you definitely want to hear that. Um, but after we met, you know, it kind of came out that I was non-monogamous at the time. And um, so when we first started dating, he was dating other people. I was dating other people. And I was not interested in narrowing everything down to one person um, because that had been a problem with me in the past. Is kind of like focusing on somebody and then um, trying to make that relationship work and become the relationship I wanted it to be. Yeah, so, this, <laughs> so this was a much better way. So, for, so we just never stopped doing that. 
is really what happened. You know, that's how we started, and then that's how we kept on. Okay. <laughs> is it um like but but where did you actually like connect and meet? Oh, I was organizing the 1994 Leather Celebration in New York City. It was a um, the celebration around the Stonewall 25th anniversary. So normally the March on Washington would happen in Washington, but they moved to New York City. And so I was on this wonderful committee called Leather Pride Night. And it was one rep from each group came together to form the Leather Pride Night auction that happened once a year that brought all the people in the community together in New York City. It was amazing. It crossed all kinds of orientation, identity lines. I mean, the entire communities came together that one night to raise money for Heritage of Pride, which was the Pride Parade that happens every year in New York, and the um, LGBTQ Center, um, where we were, a lot of us were holding our meetings. It was kind of, we were buying our way in, right? Um, yeah. We give you money, you let us meet. So we decided, well, hey, it's the 25th anniversary. It's going to be a March on Washington. Let's hold a huge conference. So I'm the one who went out and got a hotel on 42nd Street to agree to host this conference. And um, <laughs> what? When was this? This was in 1994. Oh, that's when, <laughs> when um, 42nd Street was like dirty. <laughs> Grand Hyatt Hotel, and um, afterwards the, the sales manager got fired, unfortunately, because his corporate overlords did not like the fact that he signed this contract. But in me and my, you know, being naive, I just walked in with a good hotel agent and I got an ironclad contract with him. And so we had uh, 2,000 people come to this giant conference and we had, we actually rented out one of the armories for the dance. And so I'm going, uh, leading up to this, I keep going on uh, cable network shows because there was huge amount of cable network shows back then. So late night, I was on these di different cable shows with my friends who were also producing this. And Kelly happened to be up late one night and he saw it. And he uh, he thought, oh, you know, I like her. And so it showed the name of the group and it was a munch. And so he came down the next Monday night and uh, met everybody at the munch. And he ended up coming down like for two months and before he finally asked me out. He kind of made friends with all my friends. He moved very slowly. If he had told me that first night that he'd see me on TV and tracked me down, I would have been like, ah, you know, <laughs> back off. But he Bunker. saw immediately who, who I was and how I was and the fact that I like to move a little slower and know who people are. And, um, and he, it wasn't until like six months later after we were dating that he told me he had seen me and tracked me down. And then at that point, it was just wonderful. It wasn't, it, it didn't feel like a stalker at that point. <laughs> I want you to at the beginning, I think. <laughs> and for the people, for the people who don't know what shows you're on, can you list some of the, um, even if, you know, they're, may, you know, they're not around now, you know, list some shows that you were a guest, a guest of? Uh, Dale's Dungeon was a big one. I actually went on Dale's Dungeon several times, and it was a um, <clears throat> it, it was a lot like this. It was friends. He he was talking to his friends about different kink practices and different clubs and different groups. And they also had um, you know the thing the thing about it is they had anybody could have their own cable network show. Oh, you mean public access? You're talking about yeah. yeah it was public access. Yeah. yeah anybody. I, could have anybody. Access. All you have to do really is is um, Fill out the paperwork yeah. and take some and and like take some classes. I, it, I'm a big fan of the Chris Gethard show, and one of my friends, Brett Davis, who was on this show, has a show called The Special Without Brett Davis on cable access show. And there's a fascinating, absolutely fascinating culture in cable access. Like, uh -huh. yeah, they're, they're like the weirdest stuff you could curse. I think, think I was on Elvira After Dark. When she, you know, it was way back then, it was, oh my God, there was a bunch of people that were just like celebrities on cable access. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. There was, a, there was a, it was like a, a naked, uh, in New York, especially, there was like a, a naked couple where they, they just like stay there naked. You wouldn't like see everything, but like they would just be there naked. There was this, there was this one guy, um, he was, he was like a, like a, a gang member and he would, um, he beat up someone or he freaked out and they kicked him out. But still, he every every week he 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 went to security 
gave them a tape and they put it on the air <laughs> of the show. <laughs> It, it, it was it's wild if if you're fans of cable access definitely check out the chris gethard show and the special without brett davis um they're they're very very funny they're very weird they're very quirky it, um you'll have a good time okay um <laughs> cable access okay let's get a little more serious fosta sesta what are you mm -hmm. doing and what is um ncsf um doing you know, to kind of squash this bill or change this or get do, do, to save us. <laughs> you know, this, we saw this coming uh, way back in 2016. We did an election um, campaign and um, we urged everybody to ask um, their, the people who were running, you know, what they felt about these sex trafficking laws that were coming out and, and being used against us. And since then, we've seen six different events shut down by these religious extremist groups that are accusing us of being sex traffickers. Um, they're using this language against us. So it is a serious problem. Um, so for the laws itself, uh, we're um, hosting, um, helping to co-host um, Lobby Day. We're in Washington DC on June 1st. We're actually um, running the training to train people to go in and talk to Congress members so that you, we're not just throwing you in. Um, we're giving you sound bites, you know, things to talk about because we want to be all on the same page. So we've worked quite a bit with our sex worker allies. Um, Survivors Against SESTA has done a couple of media trainings that were excellent, um, trying to get people on the same page about how to talk to the media and what to say to the media. And um, we're supporting them because they are, have a lot of the clearinghouse for a lot of the information that is happening. Um, there's actions, day of actions happening on June 1st and June 2nd all around the country um, in different um, cities that you can participate in and kind of show a voice for, um, you know, removing online censorship because that's really what this has come down to. So we're also working with groups like Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Free Speech Coalition to see if we can um, find somebody like a group, like a harm reduction group for sex workers that's been negatively impacted by this, that they can bring a legal challenge. Because we we figure that would be the best way to do this rather than having Craigslist protest that their personals are no longer up there. The pro, I mean, that affects thousands and thousands and thousands of people yeah. and their sex life. But it's not looked at as sympathetically as a harm reduction agency. So we're trying to really be um, smart about this and work with other groups around this because um, we're not really sure how far this is going to go. There's a lot of preemptive action being taken by businesses for good reason. Because um, if if you know there is one ad for prostitution and a local prosecutor, a state prosecutor, goes after. Um, that and uses that as in a sting to arrest somebody like they're doing regularly now yeah. um then what they can do is tack on this um charge of of sex trafficking um for the online um website that hosted that ad um so they're not just getting now the the prostitute and the john uh, or the prostitute or the john by trying to do some kind of entrapment they're actually arresting them, but then going after the um, the website, which could be doing all kinds of things. And this is just one message. And if you, if you don't control it, it can actually be used to try to shut you down. Yes. Um, and for those who don't know, who are, are watching or listening, um, SESTA FOSTA are these, these sex trafficking laws that just started, uh, that Congress put through, and um, Craigslist the personal ads got shut down, which a lot of, especially gay men, um, used, you know, um, but like, you know, doms used, sissies used, um, you name it. Um, was our use that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And then um, Backpage was another site that got t completely shut down. Which a lot of doms, you know, pro doms used. Um, a lot of uh, people who did porn would use to to find other actors and stuff like that. Um, uh, Fet life has changed a lot of policies, and this made all like all my professional um, dom friends 
um, they they had to they couldn't. It, they couldn't say they're a professional dom. They're or they 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 changed. They took a lot of pictures down. They took a lot of writings down. They took a lot of um, profiles stuff down. And you know, um, it's it's to a point where I feel that it could get. I mean, I mean, it's definitely going to get dangerous if it doesn't if, if things aren't changed because sex workers are going to have to go underground. And with that, but when it comes to going underground, it comes with danger it comes with violence it comes with danger it comes with pimps you know it comes um you know the risk of of being you know of, of being arrested and so yeah so in what other ways besides because you're you know you you, you know sex workers you know you're in the community in what other ways besides fet life and craigslist and backpage have other people been affected well, the super serious, which is um, we've had sex worker allies tell us that um, uh, one of them actually told me two weeks ago that they knew of 14 sex workers who had either disappeared or been um, hurt or murdered because they've been forced out onto the streets. So they're actually tracking that people are physically being hurt by this. They can oh. no longer, yeah, they can no longer vet people online, which is actually a very safe way to vet somebody um, is online, rather than being on the street, um, to um, things like um, our, you know, our internet hosting is, is um, being affected. You can lose your um, provider. Um, Cloudflare was supporting Twitter, um, and they're a giant in the field. And um, they felt enough pressure that they decided they would no longer host that site. Um, so it really puts our, um, our communities in the hands of corporations to decide how much risk they want to take and, um, and they can shut us down at any time. And that's what we're facing is losing that network. I mean, we're in a kind of a golden age of kink right now, just because we have places online to go and to network and talk to each other and, you know, if we lose that, we're all going to be isolated again. And um, it's going to be up to the groups to try to somehow put the word out, which they don't want to put it out publicly. I mean, the beauty of the groups, the way they're able to survive is by kind of taking a lower profile um, and not advertising to the general public. Because um, as soon as you stick your head up, you know, there's going to be somebody taking shots at you in today's climate. Yeah. That's why there's something called, it's called um, Twitter, which is sex work Twitter. Well, um, that's, and, that's what I was talking about. They were on Cloudflare. They were hosted by Cloudflare, but then they got kicked off and they had to move to a new provider. If that new provider decides to get rid of them, they're going to be in trouble. The new provider is in Iceland, I hear. Yeah. <laughs> so everyone's going to go. So, so once again, we're going to give yeah. jobs to other countries. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna, and, you know, those countries may not have protections. You know what I mean? Like look what Facebook did with all of our private information. I mean, you don't really want that going out, especially when it involves kink and stuff like that. You wanna, you don't want somebody selling that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. One thing I remember, um, you are, you definitely talked about on other podcasts and articles and stuff like that is the Me Too movement. I wrote an article about for your kinky friends about the Me Too movement, and I, well, in my articles, I. Usually, I, I write a beginning, then I interview like maybe three or four people, and I ask them the same three or four questions. And I even got my mom, my mom, <laughs> as part of the article for the Me Too movement. So, um, tell me about your opinion of the Me Too movement, um, and and this, and tell me about your opinion of the status it is now. Well, it kind of echoes what's happened on Set Life for like the past five years. We've been seeing people speaking out on FetLife about their ex personal experience and more and more. And actually, at, at, when the Me Too movement hit, that became even more pronounced on FetLife as well. So um, it really is um, an opening up that allows people to talk about consent and how their consent has been violated or accidentally or on purpose. We've never had those avenues before. Mm -hmm. um, people just... I mean, like, think about the casting couch, just with Harvey Weinstein example. The casting couch is undoubted. 
so undoubted that it's a joke and that the women who actually do do the casting couch are scorned for it. Um, even though the person who is the one kind of manipulating them into doing this is the gatekeeper. And a lot of times can decide if this person can go on in their career or not, depending on how well they're pleased. This is the perks of power. And it's been considered okay for decades, you know, a century that, okay, well, this is just the way it is. And now suddenly we're looking at through a different lens. We're looking at um, the pile of people who were affected by it. Mm -hmm. And um, finally, we're hearing all the voices of the people who are affected by it. These, these people in power are not able to just shut it down through, you know, threats of lawsuit and pay, large payments of money to, to silence people. Um, and I think that it's a good, healthy thing that we hear what's really going on. Um, I, when I look at these accusations, I always look to see, are there multiple accusations? I think that anybody can have a he said, she said. Anybody can, you know, have a moment where they make a huge mistake, Al Franken. Um, it's, it's, uh, Al you Franken, know, yeah, good point. There, is there more? You know, if there was like four or three, two. Uh, accusations against him doing something similar that would be to me something that would need to take action because that's showing a pattern of predation you can really see a pattern um, but um, when there's um, you know when when somebody comes forward and then all these people keep coming forward and telling something similar you realize yes there was interactions happening here they the, all of these people can't make up the exact same scenario. And the reason it's the same is because the person doing it doesn't care about the other person. So they're doing their thing over and over and over again. And it doesn't matter what the other person wants. Whereas most of us, when we have an interaction with different people, it's different every time because we're taking into account that person and what they want and what they've said they're looking for. So we have more unique encounters this pattern of predation really does come out. And um, and I think that that's when we need to really look and take action. Um, I have a problem when it's, when it's one time and um, somebody's career is destroyed. I think that, I think there needs to be a little bit more because honestly, I think all of us have a very bad breakup in us. You know what I mean? I think oh, all of us- yeah. I was, I was a, um, in my, my book, The Coolest Way to Kill Yourself, the fir for the first half of it, um, I was like, people don't like me <laughs> so, because I was a jerk. I was as a teenager. I was a cocky jerk. And, and like I had I had this kind of weird male privilege, which was, uh, you know, horrible. And, um, you know, I never forced myself on a woman. I never never did anything non, non consensual. But I did, you know, I did say some things that probably hurt a lot of feelings. And um, and it, it, luckily it was me being friends with women who let me know like they didn't just school me they like like i saw firsthand how they were affected by other men and um or non-consensual relationships and um like i'm very fortunate and i've, I've that made me grow as a person and you know so mm -hmm. i th i personally think the me too movement is like we got to listen Gonna listen, listen to these women, even even the men. Terry Crews, big dude, funny as hell. He's in Brooklyn Nine Nine. Brooklyn Nine Nine. Yeah, um, he came out as uh, saying I, I was sexually harassed by an agent, you know, by a male, another male agent, you know. So I mean, we, personally, I think we gotta listen. That's that's what we gotta do. We gotta we gotta listen to each other. That's that's my opinion. <laughs> okay, all right. So who? First of all, um, I have a series uh, of articles that I'm doing, and I want you to be a part of it. And I call it Heroes of the King Community. And, <laughs> and you know, they got people like Sarah Miles from Pep Love. We got uh, Morgan Ashley. We got Kevin Allison from the Risk Podcast, um, from the Black People King Podcast. And these are people who are well-known and even not well-known, but they're doing their part. You know, they're doing their part to help people. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Pep Love, but Pep Love is it started out as like a kink counseling phone sex thing. So it's a lot of people call up and they don't just like start jerking off or whatever. They 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 talk about like I want to express my kink. I like like how can you know we do this and how can you know? So who are some of your heroes 
in the kink community? Um, some of my heroes, uh, one of them is Ray Spannon, who is um, a Leatherman who worked with Guy Baldwin to actually work on the, um, uh, to fight the American Psychiatric Association way back in the 80s. They were the first ones to kind of launch the DSM revision project to uh, remove the paraphilias. Um, and which we eventually in 2013, NCSF carried the project on and we got the APA to differentiate between the paraphilias and the paraphilic disorders, which is why people are not routinely considered mentally ill um, if you're kinky anymore. Whereas it used to be you could interpret it. And in fact, lawyers would often open up the DSM and would interpret it themselves. So race was a huge, huge part in setting that up. He also founded the Kink Aware Professionals database that NCSF took over. So he was one of the early activists who was fighting um, against discrimination in professional circles. And so for that, he's definitely a hero of mine. I also have a hero, um, Barry Douglas, um, and he was uh, in a partnership with Bruce Marcus at the time, and they were gay male SM activists. And uh, Barry was kind of my activist mentor. And they, they took me, a woman, into gay male SM activists and made me an honorary member because I was working on these activist projects and they wanted to support me. And, and that's when I realized, yes, this is how you do it. Early on in my career, I realized you cross those lines to work together and that's how you have some power and influence because alone, we just don't. So there's three gay men who are my heroes. <laughs> That is wonderful. Now, um, as someone who is, you know, very sexual, very open-minded to to kink, and very much an activist, um, there are people who want to explore kink, um, especially you know, younger people, teenage, twenty-year-olds, or whatever, even thirty-year-olds, you forty, fifty, whatever. But there are many people out there who are scared to explore um, their kink. They feel kind of shame, especially like, for example especially cross-dressers, you know, people who are into femdom and stuff like that. But like, I mean, every kink, there's always people who are, are scared to sexually express themselves. What advice would you give to somebody who feels that way? I would definitely say reach out and connect online. If you can't do it in person, there's a lot of people that are not interested in joining groups. But you can reach out online and especially like in places like FetLife, um, you know, join uh, one of the local groups in your area so that then you start talking to other people and you can hear about parties and events and um, start making those connections. You can actually start talking about what it is that you want. I think a lot of people are afraid because they've never really been taught how to voice what it is that they want in an accepting way. I mean, that's why we see this sub frenzy that happens. I think a lot of that is just people coming in and realizing, wow, there's other people like me and I can do this stuff that I've thought about and it's okay. Um, and and I think that really is very sad that, that there is no other place like that, that that that's happening, that you have to come into the kink community, but it's also wonderful because we are here and um, we are so accepting and so understanding and whatever your kink is, boy, there's somebody who's done it like, to the nth degree yeah, <laughs> and he's ready to like tell you oh yes when you do this just keep in mind <laughs> you know tape it down well <laughs> because it could pop out at the inopportune moment i've actually cross-dressed um in new york city and it was one of the most enlightening things i've ever done is um and I did it several times, uh, dressing as a as a as a man and going out to like the leather bars, wearing a leather jacket, and being with my partner who's a man. And so we were kind of, you know, experiencing that together. And I I just realized how much how people look at you is looked at through the lens of your gender, and how much of us is really dictated by our gender. And it allowed me the freedom to start finding out well who am I really. You know, if I'm not this femme person that people look at when I go out and I'm suddenly this invisible guy, this young mm -hmm. invisible um, guy, who am I really? And uh, it was just, I think everybody should do it. Um, so you, you don't need to be afraid of it. It's, it's, um, it's a self-exploration. And now, when, um, when you did it, were you, because for example, um, 
my dom and I sometimes do the forced cross-dressing thing, but I don't act like a woman. I act like a submissive. You know, I mean, many, many people, many people who, when that happened, they act like the woman. Did you act like a man, or you just like looked like the man? No, I was, I was trying to bring out the masculine in me. So I was, I was doing my best to be manly. I, I, I did not do very well, which is why I felt like a very young man. I felt like a boy trying to be a man. Ironically, you know, like a like a seventeen year old trying to be a man, you know, and um, because I wanted to explore that side of myself. So I mean, even just the way I express myself now, I'm just so femme that I wanted to find out other aspects of myself. And I think that's what the force cross dressing does is it 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 does allow you to like, um, you know, kind of look at things differently. It's not, even if you're not acting like a woman you are being treated like a woman, you know what I mean? Or being called a woman, you know, which is, I, I think that anything, anytime you're playing with gender, our gender roles are so rigid in yes. this society. I so totally rigid. agree. And now that we're talking about gender, when you talk about, when we, there's a part of me that kind of almost feels bad for forcing this, for, for uh, engaging in the stereotype that all women are submissive. You know, even though a woman is being dominant with me and putting me in a dress and because I'm in a dress or a French maid outfit or something like that, I'm submissive. You know what I mean? It's like, so what do you, what, what do you, what's your idea on that? I think that that's legitimate. I mean, throughout history, women have forced into, been forced into submissive roles. I mean, in some ways you are reenacting our historical perspective and, um, I don't think you have to worry about your reinforcing the patriarchy. I think that what we do in our personal lives is to our personal benefit and and for ourselves personally. So even though the personal was political, I don't think that you have to like censor yourself because you know you don't. I mean, like I'm a woman and I'm submissive, and you know what I mean. And there's plenty of women that are submissive, um, so uh, it's completely legitimate to do that. I think. And I think that that's also part of the things that the fact that it kind of makes you a little uncomfortable or makes you oh, question yeah, yeah. things oh, is part of probably the allure of it because it throws you into this heightened state where kind of like all your higher functions and your lower functions are all like really excited. And that's why we do this. I mean, we really enjoy intensity. We like mm -hmm. challenging our minds, our emotions, our bodies. And that's why we're doing this. Okay, so uh, let's move on. Where um, we got, I got one more question, and um, well, I got a, a bunch of questions, but two segments. <laughs> so um, we have a, um, a reoccurring segment called Kinky um, Thrifty Kink Thursday. So every Thursday, an article comes out, basically on um, how to be how to do BDSM on a budget. You know, um, and look, I'm saying I am totally saying if you have the money, support high-end BDSM equipment, paddles, leather, outfits, you name it, but not everybody has the money. So do you have any tips to be kinky, you know, on, on a budget? <laughs> yes, I do. I have actually a great tip. I think that um, volunteer for your local event or your local group, because often volunteers are comped in to the event, um, depending on how much work you do. And yeah, or, um, you know, if you run the door for an event, you don't have to pay the door charge because you're there taking the money for everybody, but you also get to see the event, you know? So I, and I also think it has the added benefit of not only costing you less, you're also supporting the group because we need our volunteers there to do this. And um, you get to meet people that way. The best way to meet people is to volunteer. You suddenly have like a whole set of new friends. That's and they'll it. introduce you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. This is two more segments. The first, the first, the first segment is rapid fire questions, and they really never go rapid fire, and they don't okay. have to, they don't have to be BDSM related, okay, or kink related. Okay, what was the last movie you saw? And it could be something you've seen a million times. It could be old. It could be new. It could be something you saw for the first time, but. What's the last movie you watched that really emotionally hit you or that you just really, really loved? Um, uh, ooh, see, I don't like watch a lot of movies. Um, oh, what did I watch? 
over again. Oh, you know what? It's not a movie, but it's really funny. It, it, it hit me so much emotionally, but it was really funny because it was a throwback. You know, The Karate Kid? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, huge movie in my youth, right? Well, they came out with this YouTube series. Cobra called Kai. Cobra Kai! Oh my gosh! It is brilliant. It takes the, the blonde kid who was the aggressor and the snob is now the underdog. And uh, the Karate Kid is now on top. And it, 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 I'm just, I'm really enjoying it. It's very complicated and very richly done. Uh, textural i mean it's really and of course it's the throwback so it's also amazing so that's kind of really, my, my <laughs> it got really good reviews on uh rotten tomatoes like it's it's getting like excellent publicity and stuff like that yeah well i we stumbled on it and we were just like oh my gosh <laughs> this is great <laughs> okay. okay recommend a book a book you know what i'm reading a new book right now which i totally recommend it's called uh, Love is not colorblind, and this is by Kevin Patterson, and he talks about um, the intersection of uh, racial issues and polyamory. Um, as a person of color, he often has to represent when he goes into poly circles, and so he's very instructive on um, why this is an issue and why this is so important for us to all to be sensitive to um, to uh, diversity issues, and and not just um, not just say we want to be diverse, but actually, you know, concrete things to do to reach out to make your group more diverse. Okay, love's okay. not. I, I've heard that. I've I've seen that in my feed um, because you know I'm an author and I get a lot. And plus, I do the your kinky friends thing, so I'm constantly getting book book okay. suggestions. That one's right I, here. I, I'm, I'm reading it because NCSF is really concerned about making sure that we serve um, everybody. And it's always been um, a concern to us, the fact that there's not a heavy uh, people of color involvement in you know mainstream kink events. Um, although Onyx, men of Onyx and women of Onyx are a very strong group. Um, and we went to LLC this past year in March. The Atlanta community is amazingly diverse and really energized. So I'm realizing if you just uh, reach out and and take the time to go to go into spaces where uh, you can actually do the outreach to people, you can you can uh, make our community much stronger. Um, speaking of people of color, let's give a shout out to the Black People Kink podcast, Dominus Blue and Baby J. They did my show. I I did their podcast. They are awesome. You should check them out. Black People Kink podcast. Um, it's you know. It's for everybody, but you know, they do take, they do take it from the you know the black perspective on things, and um, yeah, it's a great podcast. They're, and they are very dynamic, wonderful, uh, positive, um, active people. So, Black People King podcast. Um, okay, and what was the last song? It could be like I said, it could be old, it could be some song you heard a million times, it could be brand new. It doesn't matter. Um, what was the last song that really hit you emotionally or that you really got down, you know, either you danced or you just like, you just really got into? Oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. Okay. Um, <laughs> no wrong answer. I just got a new truck. It's a four wheel drive truck because I'm living out in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. So we're going out into the desert. It's a little truck. It's the perfect for me. It's a little tough girl's truck. Right. So I'm in my new truck driving around and um, air supplies. I'm all out of love comes on. Oh, no, I'm, no. <laughs> I'm so lost without you. So um, <laughs> this was like, you know, when I'm 12, I'm listening to songs like this. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so it was like it took me right back to when I had a truck when I was, you know, 18 years old in, in, in Phoenix driving around at the, the windows down. and. Um, so yeah, it took me right back in my own history. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, we're gonna wrap things up, um, but this is this is the last segment. Word association. Now, this is I'm gonna say a word or a phrase. You say, and it's kink related, and you say the first thing that pops into your head. Oh, dear, somebody's gonna be able to use this to psychoanalyze me. Yeah, but like, um, yeah, <laughs> say the, the first thing that. The, uh, <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. Don't okay. overthink it. Don't overthink it. So, like, even if it's, you say nonsense, that's fine. Okay. 
Okay. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> um, sissies. Pink. <laughs> Chastity. Hmm. More pink. <laughs> butt plugs. Ooh, jewels. <laughs> Sparkly. Uh, <laughs> um, specific sissies. Uh, oh, did I say that? What? Uh, yeah, you think you did was pink, but my little missy. I have oh, a little missy sissy. I love. <laughs> The daddy baby girl dynamic. H play, yay. Uh, diaper play. I love babies. <laughs> I love babies. Leather. Ooh. Uh, you know, respect. Okay. Right, latex. Ooh, shiny. Race play. Mmm, edge play. Fire play. Mm, so pretty. <laughs> Max play. Uh, not BDSM. <laughs> Knife play. Oh, edge play again. <laughs> and be careful. <laughs> Accidents happen and you can get in trouble. <laughs> Pegging. Pegging. Very common. <laughs> Choking. Ooh, be careful again and talk about it before you do it. I got to have like a few words on that one. All right. Sc scarification. Scarification. Oh, Fakir. Fakir, who did body modification. He's our grandfather who is not doing well. Um, okay. Water sports. Mm, Donald Trump. <laughs> 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 I, was, I, was, I was talking to someone about water sports and, and and she goes, yeah, that's why he's orange. Uh, I think it's amazing that he knows all the terminology. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, scat. Hmm. Very personal choice. Uh, very personal choice. Okay, can you do one more thing for me before we go? Oh, well, actually, two more things. First of all, can you say, um, this is Susan Wright from NCS, ncsfreedom.org, and check out your kinkyfriends.com, or go to your kinkyfriends.com? Great. This is Susan Wright with ncsfreedom.org. Check out your kinkyfriends.com. Wonderful. Now, please, this is the time. This is We're, we're ending now. Um, Plug away anything Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. If you have a store that you sell knickknacks, you know, that's not, there's nothing to do with King, but you plug that too. Um, yeah, give us your websites. Uh, check out mtsfreedom.org. We have a Cafe Press uh, website uh, shop that shows, uh, sells t shirts, got consent t shirts, as well as NCSF t shirts, and all sorts of things like bags and mugs and banners. Um, and you can join on ncsfreedom.org. You can find out how you can help, and there's tons of resources. Um, in case you need anything, uh, check it out. We have everything on there, and you can always contact us if you need help. Great. Susan, you have been a magnificent guest. This is Nicholas Tanek from yourkinkyfriends.com. Check me out on Twitter, Nicholas Tanek. Um, my last name is T-A-N-E-K. Um, you can check me out on Instagram at Nick Tanek. N-I-C-K-T-A-N-E-K. -E I'm on Facebook as Nicholas Tanek, and everything is going to you know, be on here. So, um, and join the chat. Go to Your Kinky Friends. There's a Discord chat. It's really fun. There's And everyone's really cool and kind, and they all keep an open mind. Um, so that's one of that's my motto, basically. So, um, yeah, so just check out yourkinkyfriends.com. Um, Susan, I'd like to talk with you for about like, you know, 30 seconds afterwards, after we stop broadcasting. Um, and you've been absolute delightful guest. Like, seriously, you are amazing. You're intelligent. 
you're kinky, you're, you know, you're political, you're, you're in, in, it, it, it was, a, I am honored to, to interview you. Um, yeah, um, you help people and that is the most important. And that's, that's what kinky people should do. Kinky people should, if you're kinky and you know other kinky people, or if you know someone who wants to be kinky, anyone who's watching this, help them out. You know what I mean? Be, be cool, be kind and keep an open mind. Now, it's that time. I gotta go. My Dom is calling me. Stay kinky, my friends. <laughs>